Nothing the screen has ever shown before can surpass the thrills of the Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space Podcast. Created from an atomic fireball hurled from outer space. The Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space Podcast. Threatens man's very existence on Earth. The Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space Podcast. Battles Godzilla, Mothra, and Rodan for mastery of the world. Men quake before the terror of their unleashed fury. All new, all never to be forgotten. A new high in... Visions from Monsterland. Hello everyone, welcome to Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space. My name is Jerry and joining us as always, we've got a, a great crew. We have Venom. Greetings and salutations, Kaiju lovers. Uh, we also have Don. Screonk, everyone. And of course, bringing up the rear, we've got Derek. I'm here, guys. We are all <laughs> here and we are here to uh, do our second Gamera movie, but we're jumping from the Showa side and going to the first movie in the Heisei series with Gamera Guardian of the Universe, uh, which is, a uh, funny enough, uh, came out right after Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, which was our last episode. This one came out in 1995. Um, and uh, also, funny enough... Uh, we talked about in the last episode about how this movie was critically loved and had half the budget of Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. Um, and while it still didn't make as much money as Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, this is the movie that, that 90s kaiju fans think of when they think of the best of the best. Um, directed by Shusuke Kainoko. Kainoko. Kaneko. 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 Um, and uh, we have special effects, which is very important in this, uh, done by uh, our main guy is Shinji Higuchi, which you know from uh, the rest of the Gamera 90s trilogy. But you also have uh, Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, All Out Attack, and Shin Godzilla he has worked on. And he was the burning dummy in Def Kappa. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> That's, uh... I'll bring it. I'll bring it up again. A cameo, an actual on-screen cameo appearance, and the burning dummy in Death Kappa. <laughs> don't uh, look. Don't bring up bad movies when we're talking about a good movie. Uh, okay. Uh, so in this one, we have a hibernating species of giant carnivorous birds is awakened on a Japanese island shortly after the military encounters an unidentified mass. Moving beneath the water offshore. That's a weird thing. Beneath the water offshore. Just in the <laughs> middle of the, fucking... the water onshore. Yeah, like, <laughs> who fucking wrote this? I need answers. Uh, does this tell me who wrote this? Okay, it, do it does. Tom Bitten. What the fuck, man? Why did you write this? Okay, whatever. I, I can't do uh, these people. Um,. <laughs> So yeah, we are tackling this one now. Is this anyone's first time watch? Nope. No. Nothing yet. Don? First time watching the Japanese version. I've seen the American dub. This is the first time seeing the Japanese version. Oh, well, I mean, I don't really think there's much difference between the Japanese dub. dub. No, yeah, it's it's a dub. I I remember enough of it that it's just a dub. It it's exactly the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, all right, cool. Well, let's get into it. Uh, we're going to open it up with Venom. Venom, what did you love about this movie? Um, I love the kaiju action, man. The fight scenes in this movie were great. Um, 
you know, they definitely kind of shirked the standard, you know, hour and 20 minutes of human story just to set up a five to 10 minute kaiju fight at the end of the movie. We actually got a couple of different fights of varying lengths, and I just thought that they were both great. I preferred the final fight, obviously, with Super Gauss. But um, the earlier fights with the smaller ones were still, you know, very appealing in their own right. And actually watching Gamera take one of the small Gausses out with one swing of his uh, claw was pretty awesome. But yeah, overall, just really enjoyed um, the, the kaiju action and the Gamera design. Thought it was a great improvement over the Showa era. Still kind of a, a softer look to them. I mean, they're not trying to make them necessarily scary because they are still going for the hero Gamera, but I still did prefer this design over what we got at, during the show of years. Oh, Gamera gets darker. Oh, <laughs> does he get darker. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Derek, what did you love about this movie? There's a lot I love about this movie, but I'll save it when I think about it for my final thoughts on it, but... Uh, I just like the whole story. It's a great concept. I like the mixture of genres within it. Like, there's some horror elements, some you know, sappy comedy moments, which were kind of funny with the detective. He's kind of a stupid character, but he's funny. Uh, you know, there's some goofy stuff too. Like some of the humor in it's kind of fun. Kaneko always mixes some weird characters within his story plot lines, and I just like the mythology of like a what's going to be coming up with Gamera and like uh, Asagi's character and the mixture within it. Uh, and it builds more into the series as the trilogy goes on too, which I do dig. It's a good setup movie with a lot of good setup characters. And just like Venom said, you know, great kaiju action. Love it all. Yep. Yep. Uh, Don, what did you love about this movie? Well, since most of my answers have already been taken, I guess I'll default to my old standby. Um, I actually think this is a pretty decent score here. You know, Gamera gets a really rousing entrance theme. He's got a pretty nifty theme song as well. And I, I really think that there's a nice balance between like the horror elements, like Derek was saying, that the, the island scenes at the beginning come off like really tense and atmospheric. And then there's like a nice zippy action theme for like the main battles, so since they took my main thoughts because I follow directly in line with them regarding the kaiju action and the enjoyable story. I guess I'll have to default to my old standby. Uh, that was actually my second one if the, my first answer wasn't taken either, Don, so I hear you there. <laughs> hey, the I, score is actually I always good. wait to, to go last, so I, I always get the slim, slim pickings. Uh, but I'm actually kind of uh, satisfied. No one actually talked about this. Uh, I absolutely love the miniatures in this movie. The everything being destroyed in this movie looks so fucking good. Uh, between um, uh, the towns they're destroying, uh, or even when um, like the forest gets caught on fire, like the special effects uh, in in the miniatures in this movie just look glorious and on point. And it kind of makes me go, man, they had. Uh, like 4.5 million to make this movie compared to the like 10.9 or whatever Space Godzilla had, and I think their miniatures look better than Space Godzilla. Um, they were yeah. not afraid to have a fight go down in cities and show multiple destruction. They did a good job of cropping uh, the miniatures and the real life footage. Uh, the composite shots, like it's just very well done all the way around, uh, between special effects and editing. I absolutely fucking loved it. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's move on into what we did not like. Uh, Don, we'll let you go we'll first. You go so you don't have to, so say, the have to say the music. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I don't have too many issues. I have, I actually have two legitimate flaws. One I can mention now, and one I'll save for later. The one I'm going to mention now is I don't like some of the match shots in this. And there's specific scenes, and they're nitpicks because they only last maybe a second, if not more. But the shot of Gal swooping down to pick off, you know, the pickoff attempt on the 
woman in the shore who notices her dog's been missing and you see Giles flapping behind her. So she dives right in just at the last second. When you see mm-hmm. Giles flapping by, God, that match shot just looks fucking awful. Mm-hmm. I there... mean, there's like two, yeah, there's like two noticeable differences in film quality on the sh- on the screen. And it's just noticeable and it's just really, really bad. Yeah. And you get like small little scenes like the soldiers diving into the water, which are obviously done in a swimming pool because you can see the wall <laughs> in the back. Yeah. But... And piggybacking on Don's point, too, there was one shot where Gauss uh, grabs the train off the train tracks and then a oh. chunk of it drops onto a crowd of people. I, that was almost laughable. I mean, I let out a, a, an audible laugh when I saw that. The green screen and matte work in that shot was just not very good. Yeah, and then to me, the biggest ones are the shots of Gals and Gamera flying over Tokyo. Yep. I mean, thank God they they're using miniatures for the city scenes. They're not using like you know Godzilla versus Destroyer stock footage of actual you know, actual Tokyo shots, they're using miniatures, so it kind of balances a little bit better. But, I mean, all of the match shots in this are just atrocious, and they look really noticeable because, like you guys have said, the rest of the effects in this are just absolutely beautiful to look at. And to see that every single time that they try this tactic, it fails spectacularly and noticeably. It's just... It's not necessarily a detrimental feature but it's just a distracting one due to the fact that it's every single time they try it that's fair okay Derek, uh, what did you not like i actually have very minimal problems with this movie at all honestly my major concern and this is because i watched both versions today the english dub is fucking terrible <laughs> yeah, it's an international dub. International dubs are kind of notorious for being bad because they're usually done by the company who made the movie. So it's Japanese trying to get Americans to do the dub, and it just never really goes over well. Yeah, like like the detective character's voice sounds like a fucking he got kicked in the balls by a donkey. Look, I thought he was wait. slow. I actually thought that he was uh, like mentally challenged like i i don't want to say the word but yeah he he definitely comes off like a special olympian because it's brought up i'm gonna say my my biggest dislike in this movie is that inspector osako character i don't Uh, like him i don't like when he's on the screen i feel like he's supposed to be a comic relief character but he never does anything funny i don't know if there's a cultural thing that i'm not understanding about him uh because he's not dumb uh he, he's the guy that figures out to use the fucking stadium like yeah he is important to the plot uh he figures out the stadium he's the one that gets mayumi to uh go searching for the birds and all this shit but like it's just like i wish they would have just done a better job and made him a more serious character because whenever he's on the screen i'm just like can someone fix his fucking hair? Give him a comb. <laughs> let him brush his goddamn hair. Uh, Jesus Christ. Wow. <laughs> wow, you're hardcore. <laughs> I, you know how I get about, like, if a certain character is just, re- like, for some reason gets on my nerves, it can ruin a movie for me. He does not ruin the movie for me, thankfully. But... Jesus, when he's on screen, I just, like, start zoning out. Yeah. I get that. You know, I actually prefer him in the Japanese dub, in the original language version, because it just makes him seem even more retarded with that fucking accent. Yeah, I haven't seen the dub in long enough to compare, but... Yeah, yeah no, this was the first time I've seen the Japanese version, so... I, I don't remember the dub enough to mention it, but... Okay, let me do an impression for you, Don. <laughs> we gotta find those birds! <laughs> we gotta find those birds! He, he's the, the only right person there. in the dub that talks with any kind of, like, inflection or anything. Everyone else just sounds fucking stupid and monotone. And he A sounds bird? stupid with a weird fucking accent. 
Yeah. Uh, all right, Venom. Um, I am on you now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got flustered because of the the guy's hair. Uh, Venom, what did you <laughs> not like about this movie? Um, the only thing I didn't really like about this movie was the fact that it devolved into a PSA about pollution and how humanity treats the Earth. Now, anyone who's been paying attention knows that by this point, we've already gotten 40 years of kaiju movies. Every single kaiju movie has an element of, you know, humans, um, how people are treating the earth, you know, radiation poisoning, blah, blah, blah. You know, every movie has a subtle um, kind of, you know, underlying layer about, um, you know, the environment and everything else. But this one... Um, you know, our, our my, Mayumi, is that her name? Yeah. When she goes on that diatribe about halfway through the movie about why the Gauss have woken up now and how she's talking about, oh, you know, acid rain and, you know, radiation levels and everything else. And literally at that moment, I just rolled my eyes. I'm just like, really? Do you think we haven't been paying attention for 40 years? I mean, the very first Godzilla had elements of, you know, how we treat the environment and everything else. And here she is kind of just putting it on a silver platter for us. And for, that might be good for younger audiences, I fully admit. But for someone who's been watching these movies for any amount of time, it's just a very frustrating scene, in my opinion. It's just, you're sla you're beating a dead horse, basically. You're right. And it feels so forced in. Like, it feels like, mm -hmm. uh, we need to answer the question of why did they wake up when... We should have just said, we don't know why they woke up. Yeah. We don't know what's going on. That would have been much on. more believable. <laughs> yeah. Instead, they're like, throw in something about acid rain and the half-life of plutonium. That will exactly. impress everyone. <laughs> yeah. It was a little too heavy-handed. That's all. I completely uh, agree there. Um, so let's talk about Gamera, uh, how he looks in this movie. Uh, still a little kiddish, especially in the face, yeah. but that suit is looking good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love the fact that he looks like he's got like sags and wrinkles. It's like, you know, like an actual turtle around the, li around the shelves where his limbs would protrude. It looks a little bit more realistic, like what an actual turtle would look like. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I do wish they kind of would not have went with his ability to, to randomly fly because uh, I always felt like that was really fucking weird and just never fit uh, and especially in a movie that kind of bound in a more of a realistic tone for them to have that in this movie I kind of go well I was hoping they wouldn't do it but at least they can be like well that's how he was created <clears throat> yeah like they yeah, said that because uh, you know uh, sorry Don but uh, you know the Atlantean like they even made that joke how else could you explain a fucking flying turtle? <laughs> you know? Well, for me, my bigger issue was why did they do the classic flying saucer look? But then later on, they revert to his head sticks out, his arms stick out, but his feet turn into jet, into rocket jets. Yeah, that's for the fans of the show of films. Yeah, but they, they switch, but they switched the forms. Yeah, because he switched his forms multiple times yeah. in the show of series. Yeah, but it's not consistent. They did the flying saucer look once when he's he, they show him in the in the flying saucer form, but then every other time his head sticks out, his arms stick out, and his feet turn into rockets. It's not consistent to you because you haven't watched all the Showa films, but for someone like me or Derek who's watched all the Showa films, he does that. He, he switches between both. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. Yeah, he has the ability to do both and... and he does. In fact, if you look at the theatrical poster for this movie, um, it shows him doing the just leg rockets on that poster because that's how the original Showa poster was. The, the theatrical poster for this is a recreation of the original Showa poster. But yeah, um, and yeah, they didn't really add that, I think, until the Gauss movie, which was the third Gamera movie. Derek, yeah. do you remember that's when they added him being able to just fucking fly with his legs? I believe so. I, because that's the since. first time he actually faced a flying monster. Because in the second one, he would just do his spinny top. Because yeah. by the time he fought uh, Berugon, 
uh, Verugon didn't fly. He yeah. tongued things and shot a rainbow out of his back. <laughs> in, Don de- in, in Don's defense, I'm on his side on this one. Only because if you're not a seasoned Gamera viewer, it is kind of a little jarring that the very first time he flies, he does the flying saucer and then just abandons that for the rest of the movie. Like yeah. they, they could have put a throwaway line in there as to maybe, you know, why, why, why do they think he does the flying saucer? Because of the pollution. And... <laughs> <laughs> so in, uh... in the original Gamera show series, he did the flying saucer when he was just traveling, um, long distances was, where he wasn't was fighting. The, defense, the magnetism, you know what I mean? Like he, it was to get away faster than. You yeah, know, as like to where his saying. his leg rocket only situation is more of a an attack way. He basically has a defense ride and an attack ride, and usually when he also because like um in uh Gamma versus Gyrion, he's going long distance. But he travels both ways. Originally, he's doing his spinny thing, and then when he has to start protecting the spaceship that the kids are on from asteroids, then he switches over to his just leg rockets. Yeah. And then he gets left that, in the dust. I mean, with that mentality, though, wouldn't it have made more sense when he was flying up to space to get Gauss to follow him for him to be in his flying saucer technique? Because he was ahead. So he wasn't being offensive. He wasn't like in, I mean, he was, I guess, technically in battle mode. Technically, he was in the middle of a battle. But the whole point of that kind of set piece was to drag Gauss up into space so that they can fall back down and, you know, try to injure him that way, whatever the case may be. I get your point, but I will Mm -hmm. say uh, normally, at least the way it seems, it always takes him longer to get into the full UFO flying form. So it probably would have just been a bad tactic in the middle of a fight to switch into that. Yeah. Because I've always seen Gamera as a much smarter kaiju when it comes to, like, like he just seems like, especially in these 90s, tr- the 90 trilogy, he seems so much smarter than, say, like, Godzilla does. Mm-hmm. Oh, like, absolutely. My buddy actually messaged me the other day, Jay from Kill the Cast messaged me, and he was like, has Godzilla and Gamera ever fought? And I was like, no, they've never fought. And he goes, who would win in a fight? And I was like, well, I think Godzilla would win because his radioactive breath, but I do, th- versus Gamera's fucking fireball, uh, but <laughs> I do think that Gamera is smarter, but I don't think smarter necessarily wins when you're dropping nuclear fucking breath. Uh, that was the mentality, or at least that was the explanation we got in the original King Kong versus Godzilla, is that King Kong has a much larger brain, so he's the more intelligent Titan. <laughs> yeah, that was great, wasn't it? When he's reading yeah, uh, that was, kids that was interesting. <laughs> I love that movie. But yeah, I, I, I guess I can follow that mentality of Gamera being a little smarter. Um, I, I probably wouldn't even answer that question. Honestly, I don't think I'm smart enough to answer it. There's, there's too many variables involved. Yeah. I mean, at best we can make educated guesses and that's kind of sure. what we do a lot of times in the, these the movies. O- yeah. The, the only way we actually know the truth is if we have a Moo Empire Atlantean to answer. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. And we don't even know which one made the fucking monsters. I, but I, you know the way I was thinking of the, I guess the way they were describing it that they're both actually the same thing, but they were just in different types of stories. I don't know because they were also saying, "Oh, well, one's in the Atlantic and one's in the Pacific," and I'm just like, "Y'all, they're fucking fairy tales. Y'all don't know shit. Shut up. Get to the <laughs> flying fucking monster." Um, most civilization, <laughs> most civilizations actually have their own version of Atlantis, so. I, yeah. I, there apparently there are multiple underwater cities out there, <laughs> or at least the mythology is there anyway. Yeah, mine exists in the Bermuda Triangle. Nice. <laughs> I love that one dude that just wanted to fucking keep the Gauss alive the whole movie. I want to keep the Gauss alive. What a dick! That dude was a dick <laughs> the entire fucking movie. He was now. It wasn't as like this movie kind of takes. Uh, he that guy is kind of the representation of what we later see in Shin Godzilla, where the government has all this red tape mm-hmm. it has to deal with. Yeah. Um, 
and we see it a lot in kaiju godzilla movies but this dude was the closest thing we got to a human villain because we really didn't have a human villain in this movie Mm -hmm. uh that we do normally actually get we either get a some kind of humanoid villain whether it's human alien uh whatever He's the closest thing we got, and he was just kind of a dick. He was just kind of a pompous fucking government asshole. I just love that he was a dick the whole time, though. It wasn't just like he was like nice to the beginning, you know? Like... <laughs> I give him credit for his conviction. He's an <laughs> asshole consistently. Yeah. I'm sure he runs the fucking EPA and will shut down fucking reactors <laughs> that have ghost containment units in them. Probably has no I do wish. I, I do wish that he would have given us... In the, that the character would have given us some kind of explanation in the movie as to why he has such a hard on for the Gauss yet well, wants to destroy Gamera. It well, doesn't he kinda, make sense. Well, he kind of. Well, he kind of does in a way when you know he's like saying Gamera is the more because the Gauss at the time were only like fifteen meters long. They weren't fucking giant right. fucking monsters, and Gamera was doing a lot more damage to the city at the time too. Let's be honest. It actually plays more into the third movie too. That kind of aspect of it, uh, and plus, you know, these are the last of their kind. He thought at the time too. We got to keep that. We could get money off these and make money and study them. You know, well, so he, he never says anything about money though. He does say like, "Oh, they're scientifically valuable," but I'm just like, "Are you a scientist? Are you a head? Do you head scientist like?" You're yeah. not the guy from Godzilla vs. Mothra who's going to open up a goddamn theme park to show off the Mothra egg. Like, there's just no explanation to why you're sitting here rubbing your hands in a money grubbing way and acting like this. They just never really explained that. And even like when the Gauss first showed up, I mean, one of his very first lines were, um, this could be an endangered species. You know, it's like the first thing he thought of when he saw the Gauss was to protect them. Then he sees Gamera, who's even more of an endangered species because he's one of a kind, and he just wants to just destroy the shit out of him. I, I just the, the motivation there, it, you know, if if it was a money thing, if it was like him just seeing dollar signs with the Gauss, I wish they would have been a little bit more plain about it. Do we actually know his title though? No. I, I I no clue. I don't remember them. He doesn't have a title in the credits either. It. No. Yeah. Uh, oh wait, well, is he just... is he EP? It says Mr. Saito EPA. Is that him? Yeah. What's EPA stand for? That, that might explain a lot. <laughs> you know. Uh, I don't know. Let me look and see if it. Uh, go into Google. EPA <laughs> Japan. Enviro. Is it still the Economic Partnership Agreement Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Uh, so it looks like it's he does work with money. He's economic partnership agreement. Um, okay. So, so that's, that's something that could have been in the movie. <laughs> well, here's the other real issue. Gauss has physically been shown to have already eaten people by that point. Gamera yep. hasn't. So I think his needs to study them should have automatically switched the second that's found out. Because nah, I mean, as big lions, as Gamera is, lions and sharks but, but as big, eat people all the time. It's fine. But as big <laughs> as Gamera is, he's not actively out hurting people. He's not out actively hunting them. But Gal- money wise, he causes way more damage. Just to by his size, to his size. I mean, only to his size. Yeah. But Gauss is actually look, looked at as a far more threat, as a former physical threat, because it's an active hunter of human beings yeah but that's also his other argument too if if a fucking because these are if you have seen a tyrannosaurus which also fucking ate people fucking you know come alive and you know if you see fine one would you want to try to keep it alive you know yeah that's true he does say that in the movie so i mean i understand why he immediately doesn't want to try to capture gamera gamera's too big causes way too much destruction regardless of actively uh knowingly murder people like gauss does because gauss is fucking eating them people are dying when gamera fucking destroys all of these buildings and people and the country is economically affected people are put out if like 
Which also plays into the next few movies later. Yes, correct. We won't get into that, Derek. Well, you and I yeah, know. Yeah. We know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, like, I, so I understand why you would not try to save Gamera. It's like, economically, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, the gals, when they're, you know, fucking, you know, only 15 feet tall, it's like, well, why not? That's just like, you know... Shaq and LeBron standing on each other's shoulders. We can capture that and take care of it. It's not a big fucking deal. Um, and if it's murdering people, well, yeah, well, fucking sharks murder people all the time. It's okay. Lions do it. Fucking we do it. We do it Hippos for fun. Do it, Some of us know? eat people. Um, you know, so, yeah, it's not until later when we find out the full scope of the gals thing that they're doing that, but... I don't know, there are a lot of, like, background questions that this movie has that it doesn't answer that it should, but at least we know that the gals are alive because of acid rain. <laughs> so, the one answer great. we didn't need. <laughs> uh, speaking of gals, uh, great-looking suit, even though the first version of it has, like, weird googly eyes. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, that yeah, later but, but turns into... Yeah, the puppets look kind of wonky, but I love love the redesign of the full length, the full size costume. That yeah. looks beautiful. Played by a female, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. One of the first times a female played a, a kaiju, according to what I read. I didn't double check that, but um... no, it, it it is. Yeah, that was um, pretty dope. Yeah, th- there's a few that did um, Sentai work in the '80s, but in terms of of actually being a legitimate kaiju stunt performer that was the first time nice. yeah it's, it's pretty fucking dope and then gauss's uh final form when he gets the red eyes yeah. looks so much fucking vicious he just looks fucking he looks like if clive barker drew a pterodactyl <laughs> go with that it's super gauss mm. yeah Cause he lo- awesome. his skin looks like it's just straight muscle, mm-hmm. like there's no skin there. It's just smoothed over muscle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, another thing, that, you know, I, <laughs> you know, with Gamera in this movie that I do like, you know, I, you know, we got the Asagi connection, which it's kind of mythological because they don't really explain it, but it kind of explains a little bit more, like why he would be like a guardian to the kids if he had a connection to a kid in that sense. Yeah, I'm glad they, they that... downplayed the kid thing in this one. Yeah, they yeah. Did, I'm not, they, I'm they not the biggest fan route. of the acrobatic kid saving camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so before we get into the cycle, because I do want to get in her. Um, with Gauss, I did think one thing was interesting. So when he was first using the beam, he had to like fully charge up. Once he got into Super, except for one time, he could just use his beam whenever he didn't have to have the charge. Or she didn't mm-hmm. have to have the charge. And then, at one point, she does start charging up, which gives Gamera enough time to shoot a fireball at her head. Which mm-hmm. just made me go, well, that was plot convenient. Why did she have to charge up this time, but didn't have to charge up... The two, three other times, like why did they drop that once it became super? Well, you, you could have said that by the loss of energy from the cutting off the foot. I mean, you could have say that as I mean, you know, it just used the beam weapon two seconds earlier to chop its foot off. Maybe it would, have, maybe it would have to have recharged again because it just used it recently. Maybe, I mean, it's possible, but, I, but it did. The question popped into my head too while I was watching it. The whole time they were falling from space, he didn't have to charge. He was just shooting that beam like mad. And then, you know, we get the convenient charge at the end. Well, like I said, I mean, that was the way I looked at it. I mean, the first time I saw it, I saw that too. Mm -hmm. But I I could look at it as it just threw four or five charges shooting at Gamera while he was falling. Now, all of a sudden, it has to try again. And this time, it's actually not trying to do like a wounding blow, but more like a killing blow. So it's not trying to wound it. It's trying to kill it. You yeah, know, I can see that. I mean, yeah. you can look at it, you, you know, it, as it's falling, it's just tr- shooting wildly like, you know, get off my foot. And mm. then it slices the foot off. But then when you look at it, when it lands on the ground, it's like, all right, I'm done with this. Fuck off. 
<laughs> and it's trying to tr it's trying to charge because it's doing a much bigger and more powerful beam than just all right. I'm gonna you know throw my beam weapon because I have one. Uh, that was a nice callback too, huh, Jerry? Because yeah, I know Don yeah. hasn't seen the original Callus movie. <laughs> yeah, um, but I will say, like to me, that's way more inconsistent than Gamera's flying technique. Like what you're saying makes sense. It's just to me, like that's that's way more in inconsistent. The the beam technique, uh, charge or no charge, is way more inconsistent than the flying technique. I, well, I mean, it's just these little things that I wish that like they would have tweaked a little bit better. I mean, it doesn't really affect the movie overall, but yeah. there, like, it just shows like even in this like what's considered a masterpiece of '90s uh, kaiju, like yeah. there's enough in there that you can definitely go. They should have fixed this, but they just didn't have the time, money, or didn't think about it when writing the script or anything. Yeah, you know, like you could find definitely find like little nitpicks and multiple like even the masterpieces of the kaiju genre for sure. <laughs> yeah. So Asagi, uh, Akagi, what's her name? Asagi. 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 Asagi potato. Um, Asagi pussy. Uh, ah, whoa! Hey. I yo. hope not. She's um, too young for that. <laughs> no, I was I mean, sixteen. She's fine. She, She's legal now. That's all that matters. Um, so she's actually younger than me, which is creepy. Oh yeah, she was born in 1979. Um, yeah. She. Uh, one thing I do want to bring up in this movie is uh, way to do the psychic connection right. Way to just look at Heisei Godzilla movies and just rub it in their face. <laughs> no, no Godzilla movie has ever done the psychic connection better than the Gamera movie just because it's so subtle, it's important, it's not them trying to control, it's just like two souls linked together. It's so just neat and concise. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I like that thing that they do when, like, whenever Gamera gets hurt, she gets the wound too. <laughs> you know, that's crazy. Yeah, I love that. That was yeah, good. They're a little inconsistent with that also. She bleeds when yeah. he gets hit in the arm, but he, Gamera's taking beams to the fucking head and she just goes, oh, I have a headache, but she doesn't bleed. <laughs> You're right. Like, what? Are you fucking kidding me? Uh, but, you so know, whatever, it's fine. Lies. They help her not bleed. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> oh, it's, my God. I just was like... What like this movie just like does a lot of great ideas and then just later goes oh yeah I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, goes like fuck Gamera yeah, let's just do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't mind. All right well let's get into final thoughts. Does anyone have anything final they want to say about Gamera Guardian of the Universe? Yeah I will even though like we you know everyone has nitpicks. I this movie is really super enjoyable and. I think it's definitely one that you get a kaiju fan right into it. And, you know, especially if, if you, you, you showed your kids a few of the first Gamera movies and you want to skip some of the later Gamera movies where it gets weirder and freakier in the Showa series and kind of boring in some of them. Uh, <laughs> definitely just skip some of those and go right to this first Heisei one. It's fucking awesome. Love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed this movie. I thought the human story was great. And ultimately, the, the human story wasn't all that convoluted. You know, they weren't dealing with special weapons and special traps or anything. It was really just, you know, uh, these human characters dealing with the emergence of Gauss and Gamera. So it was a nice basic story. They also went ahead and added, you know, the little psychic link there with the... Uh, with the comma jewel thing that was found and, uh, you know, the doctor's uh, daughter, Asagi, um, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, no annoying kids uh, that that's always a plus. And, you know, I, you know, one minorly annoying character and that was more because of the English dub. I think, um, it's been a while since I've actually watched the Japanese version of this one. So maybe I'll, I'll revisit it soon. 
and potentially give that character another chance. But ultimately, even he's not so bad that it ruins the movie. This is easily one of the better Gamera movies I've ever seen, be it Showa or Heisei. And uh, yeah, this is a high recommend for me. Absolutely love this one. Yeah, um, like I said earlier, there was two issues I had with the film. One I mentioned at the time, one I'd saved for later. And the one I'm saving for now, I'm saving for later, and I'm going to bring it up now, is the mythological aspect to this, which I think kind of flies in the face of how realistic and grounded this is. And the mythology that they bring up, this sunken city or Atlantis or whatever, what you know, continent that they choose to assign to this that creates these creatures and saves them for eternity to come about again. To me, there's a lot of questions with that, but I will say this, knowing what I know of G of Gamera two and three, which all I have to go on are old G fan articles about the making of the movies and all that kind of stuff. So I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen the movies, but I have seen behind the scenes photos and said interviews. And I know enough about them to know that that gets answered. Looking at it as an individual standalone film in the theaters of 1995, I think there are some questionable decisions in here. There's a lot of loose threads and a lot of just, you know, unanswered questions about what those medallions actually are, what Gamera really is. You know, we brought it up earlier how he actually manages to fly and how Gauss actually survived all these years. I I get that they're going to get answered later on, and I'm well aware of, you know, like the Biolante Space Godzilla thing where a later film answers what's going on. Even though that's the case here... I still have to dock it enough just because as a standalone film, there are unanswered questions, but the fact that that there are such short and such unimportant and non non detrimental issues, I think this is probably, I would, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be completely surprised if I started ranking these, this would be in my top five of all time favorite Kaiju films. You know, the action is incredible. The miniature work is among the best the genre has ever seen. The story is what's not confusing is actually straight and to the point. It, to me, this is one of, if not an essential kaiju film. And anyone that hasn't seen it, I absolutely cannot recommend this one enough. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is, there's a reason this one was so highly critically acclaimed. There's a reason why. Uh, people talk about how this movie kind of reinvented the kaiju genre, kind of gave it a nice uh, kick that it needed. Um, while there are inconsistencies, there are some things like I agree with Don that some of the, while it's based more in realism, it still does a lot of things that just kind of seem unrealistic. Uh, but then again, you kind of have to go, well, that is a giant flying fucking turtle. So yeah, yeah, what can yeah. you do except just accept it? Um, but yeah, total classic. It is. It should be high on anyone's watch list uh, who loves kaiju films who has not seen it. Hell um, yeah. You know, uh, sorry to cut you off. Uh, it's even crazy that even Roger Ebert liked this movie. <laughs> and he yeah. usually hates kaiju movies. Really? Yeah. Yep. He liked this movie. Uh, everyone liked this movie. That's the thing. Like. Um, uh, when I say it was critically acclaimed, it was critically acclaimed all over the world. Mm. Like everyone was like space gods, like space Godzilla made more money, but you know what space Godzilla didn't do? Didn't get a theatrical limited run in America. Like gamer garden of the universe did. Toho was sitting there scratching their head. Like what the fuck did we do wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, with that, I think it's time we moved on uh, to the Ultraman report. Woo! Oh, boy. Yeah, Derek, aren't you doing this one? I was doing the kaiju fight, I thought. Oh, am I doing this one? Okay. I thought Don was. <laughs> Don, are you doing this one? 
Uh, I, I thought someone was doing it. I mean, I can do it. It's not not a big deal. Um, uh, I didn't know it was. I okay. Wait, I got this. Really? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I... <laughs> all good. Terror on Route 87. Uh, this came out November 27th, 1966. Um, we are on episode 20, guys. We uh we are making it. Uh, this is about an enormous bird monster attacking motorists on Route 87. So here we go. One night at a local zoo named Amaro Park gets disturbed by an ominous bright green light that appears from the top of a mountain. Receiving a report of the incident, the science patrol is sent to investigate the area but finds nothing suspicious. Back at HQ, uh, my darling love Fuji... Uh, the pearl of my life is suddenly visited by a small boy. Without revealing, revealing who he is, the boy warns her that a monster named Hydra is going to attack Omaru Park and disappears. Relaying all that info to the science patrol, the team learns from the park's guard that the Hydra is actually a stone statue from a monster created and erected when Omaru Park was founded. The statue itself is actually a fictitious monster created by a boy named Muto Akira. That's right. He is number 28, Akira, mixed with a Muto from Godzilla 2014. <laughs> it's fucking happening. You're all going to fucking die. And this ain't uh, Akira in intestines and organs in glass jars from the movie. No, no, no. We're going full on manga where he is a fucking real boy. Who shows up and fucks everything up. And makes Tetsuo his bitch. Uh, like okay. It's like fucking, uh, fucking Juon. It's a fucking boy. Goes. Yeah, straight up. If you love the Akira movie, you really should read the manga. Because the manga is so much fucking crazier. Um, nice. Uh, when that movie was made, they, they were only like halfway through the manga. So they just kind of like completely took out the middle of the manga and wrote a whole new ending. Okay. Here we go. Uh, believing that the same boy to HQ is Muta Akira, Fuji and I head to his home. Well, they don't really know that it, that the boy that showed up is there. They don't really show that in the episode, but I guess we're going to go with that. Uh, they show up at the... Uh, a, a, Aki Bono Boys Home. Uh, Aki Boner Boys Home. Got it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, for some rapey. answers. Uh, to their shock, however, Muto Akira has been dead for six months. Now, dun, dun, dun. Uh, after a hit and run occurred on Route 87, nearby where Amuro Park was. I guess we know what the next grudge we make is going to be. <laughs> So. And sounds better than the one that we just got. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, during the investigation, though, the animals at Armo Park suddenly become restless um, without any explanation. Camels are throwing people off. They don't give a shit about you. It ain't hump day. Don't get excited. Go fuck <laughs> yourself. Uh, the science patrol continues their investigation into the night until suddenly the nearby mountain glows green once more. And this time... Hydra suddenly appears from out of it. The science patrol manages to hit the monster with their weapons, but before they can do any more harm, Hydra takes off into the night sky. The next morning, Hydra was has flown to Route 87, the site of Muto Akira's death, and begins attacking several drivers on the highway, destroying their cars. You hear that, folks? Because you had to text someone... That little boy died. No texting and driving. You can, however, change your Spotify song. That's fine. You know, just hit your swipe. Move on. Don't be searching for fucking things, okay? You can't just be like, oh, well, I'm done listening to Akira Fukube. No, fuck you. You keep listening to Akira Fukube until your ride stops. Fuck yeah. Or else oh. Muto Akira has to die. No, no Muto Akira. No. Which then causes giant bird monsters to start attacking, even though for some reason they're calling it a goddamn dragon when it's clearly a yeah. bird. Yeah, yeah, clearly Rodan and a giant turkey fucked and Ooh. had a child. No, I was thinking more like Sam the Eagle from the Muppets <laughs> fucked like a fucking horn toad. 
<laughs> you know what? Both of y'all are fired. Y'all are sick. Y'all are just sick, <laughs> disgusting individuals. Um, so, with the monster attacking, the science patrol heads out to deal with it. Hydra's incredibly fast flying speed, however, allows the monsters to outmaneuver the science patrol's attacks. In the process, the monster knocks down Hayata and Arashi's uh, VTOL, which is apparently the name of their vehicle, their flying spaceship, uh, injuring Hayata and preventing him from helping the team. Or he was shot in the arm. He he is it, no, he just kind of rubbed his arm. Uh, obviously, his soul is linked with Gamera. And Gauss obviously <laughs> struck him with a beam, and now it's bleeding. His head got hit also, but we but if it's under the hair, we don't have to show blood. Oh my god! Dim the rules. Um, with Hayata being tended to by medical staff, the science patrol picks back up the fight uh, on the monster, and after managing to trick Hydra into attacking a planet card, which let's talk about our boy Arashi. Arashi gives. No fucks. This motherfucker gets into a car, fast and furious is it, towards Hydra, jumps out of it while it's going at full fucking speed, and then pulls out a gun and starts blasting the car, making it explode, and then just running away and taking shots at Hydra. Arashi, you're crazy. You're a crazy man. You're just out there doing it. I want it. I want him in the next Fast and Furious when it finally comes out. For real, this dude is like the, like, yeah. he is the Japanese version of Jason Statham in every movie he's in. <laughs> <laughs> Only a uh, better actor. Uh, whoa, well, uh, if you've never seen Jason Statham act before, uh, he's only acted in two movies, uh, London and Snatch. Every other movie, that's just him high on drugs. But those two movies, he actually did act in. I, I haven't seen either of those. So. Point those. You've never seen Snatch? Well, I guess you wouldn't have. You need to see Snatch. You like dogs. I've oh, seen Snatch all the time. I, like I just don't want to watch the movie. Dogs. Oh, you're going to watch it. It's fucking great. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I want to see Fuji Snatch. Okay. Uh, so... <laughs> Um. Oh. <laughs> oh, God damn. Okay, so, um, so he's blasting the monster with the spider shot, uh, which provokes Hydra, who chases him off. Hayata then sneaks away and transforms into Ultraman, which means I get to stop talking. Don, Derek, one of you, this is your point. This is your cue. Derek's taking it. That's your <coughs> cue, big boy. Uh, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Lag. Yeah, here, I, I got it. Ba boom. All right. Ultraman fight time. Ultraman flies right into Hydra, stands on a mirage of grappling moods, then leads to a mountain Ultraman on the ground in a weird up and down motion. Ultraman escapes by the violation by kicking out of it and tries to use his karate chop, but Hydra bitch slaps him in the face and Ultraman gets knocked out. Knocked the fuck out. Damn. <laughs> Ultraman gets up and dodges future bitch slaps from Hydra. After being pecked in the face, Ultraman uses his specimen ray by Hydra but he dodges and flies away with a little Asian ghost boy flying on his back. <laughs> yep, at this point, uh, the hero stops himself. Realizing what Hydra was supposed to represent, Ultraman takes off as well, and Hydra disappears on his own. Fuji, of course, explains to us that it was just getting revenge on the drivers, so uh, I guess that's okay? I don't know. This is a weird fucking Ooh. ending. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Back at Omaru Park, the Science Patrol ponders if Hydra was a manifestation of those uh, lives who were lost in other hit-and-run accidents, and if Hydra's appearance was just representing Muto Akira's ascension into the afterlife. It's still not okay to try to kill people with a giant monster just because you got killed. 
<laughs> this is the weirdest I spit on your grave take I've ever seen. <laughs> it's uh, Jew on what a kaiju. Yeah, it's the grudge, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um So yeah, that's that's the episode. So let's get into uh what we thought. Um I've talked, uh Derek's talk, so Venom, let's let you talk. All right, well, uh, might be surprising, but I really, really liked this episode. I liked that because a our... kid got killed by a car. Well, there's that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to see that on screen, so you know, off screen kills, boo. <laughs> but the reason, the, one of the reasons that I really like this episode is how they handle the villain kaiju in this episode. In this episode, our villain kaiju Hydra is not just like an asshole. He's just not out for destruction. He actually has a, a reason for being there. And it's and it's actually kind of an admirable one when you think about it. <clears throat> Obviously, no one is going to justify the killing of dozens of drivers on Route 87 because of one boy getting killed. But at the same time, just like, you know, we've already mentioned the grudge multiple times, but I mean, it, it's it's a valid comparison because when someone dies with you know anger in their heart that comes back as a curse and that's basically what hydra is he's a curse um you know uh, muto uh, created him for that contest and it basically became like his symbol his guardian angel in his own eyes if you will so the fact that he dies you know via car accident um and then you know somehow is able to will hydra into creation I, it, it's just it's really hard to to root against a kaiju that actually has somewhat of an admirable you know um, mo if you will. As I've already said, and I'll say it multiple more times, I'm not constant. I'm not saying that murder is an appropriate reaction to a child dying by accident. Not not at all. But Muto doesn't understand that. All, or Excuse me, not Muto. Well, Muto and Hydra both don't really understand that. All they have is their anger and their trepidation towards, you know, cars and boats and planes and whatnot, vehicles in general. So I, it, it just, I found it really hard to root against this kaiju but obviously he is killing people so you know you obviously you know in a perfect world he would stop without having to be killed and lo and behold that's exactly what we got with this one um another reason i really like this is i don't I, you guys correct me if i'm wrong but this is one of the first time we've seen ultraman get his ass handed to him i mean i i don't remember him taking a defeat like this i mean this was a flat out defeat I mean, he he never really had the upper hand throughout most of the fight. And then, you know, the kaiju that he's fighting just goes away. You know, everybody sees the image of Muto, of Muto spirit riding on top of Hydra. But, you know, everyone has that same reaction of, oh, I get it now. That's why he's destroying cars on Route 87, blah, blah, blah. So it's a very odd episode because you're not really sure you are obviously you know killing kids on a road is wrong killing innocent drivers on a road is wrong but it's one of those things where do two wrongs make a right and honestly that's up to the viewer so mm -hmm. um i just like that dichotomy of this one i liked how you know how they handled the kaiju and i just i really like to see ultraman go <laughs> no pun intended i enjoyed seeing him go down because I just, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, it's part of the reason why I hate Superman. Because he's just this shining beacon of American pride. And he never loses. And he, you know, he's, he's the strongest thing in the universe. Blah, blah, blah. So to actually see Ultraman, you know, 20 episodes in, finally take an ass whooping like that. Yet he can still walk away from the fight with his head held high. Like he did the right thing. I think that's uh, something that they haven't done with this series before, at least not that I've ever noticed. And it, it makes this episode stand out from the pack for me. It's not a favorite by any stretch, but I, I really just enjoyed the stuff that they did different with this episode. So, yeah, I'm really high on this episode. Yeah, it's nice to have a change of pace. All right. Yeah. Uh, Don, what did you think of the episode? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of fun with it. Um I think the kai the kaiju stuff is some of the best that 
some of the better stuff that we've seen in the series so far. I love Hydra's first appearance. I love the the series of little miniature battles between each of the you know science patrol members and Hydra as you you know dive bombs all over the place. But for me, yeah, I think the ending raises a lot more questions that it really didn't know it was actually raising. One of the big things for me is what what is Hydra's actual point here? If it's actually trying to defend the cars on the specific road, you know, the connection between that specific stretch of the road and where Muto died. It, to me, it just doesn't really ex- seem like there's anything there. It comes off as if, well, the creature's got to have, you know, a point for being, but there's no connection. I just, I don't see the connection between that specific road. If he's supposedly this guardian of all the children slain, it should be attacking everywhere, not just where the kid died. You know, well, they say that he's maybe the guardian of all kids, but really, all we're all, all I feel like we're shown in the in there is that he's the guardian of this one kid who created him. Yeah, I and... they kind of shove in that whole like thing where oh well maybe he's the guardian of all kids and it's just like no he's just the guardian of this one kid who who created him. That's it. That's why he only attacks Route 87. They're like, <clears throat> they kind of added that in, I guess, to make it represent everyone. And it's just like, come on, we don't need equality when it comes to Ghost. Patrick yeah. Swayze, what? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, for me, I really wish that they would have done more as well with. They had a spectacular reveal about you know, the ghost of the dead boy coming in. And I really think that they could have ex- done more with that reveal that, you know, this young boy that Fuji came in and nobody else saw is the one behind all of these mysterious incidents. It's like he shows up and then that whole thing is dropped. I mean, I, I like where it's going. I like the idea of it being like this mystical guardian figure. Just, I think they ha- came up with the idea of it, but then in execution, they just, they do things that it's going directly against. And it just kind of leaves like a weird taste, especially with this, the, the monologue that they give at the end where Mira is talking about Hydra being this this protective guardian and standing strong for all these figures that are going to be, that have been killed in the past. It just, it feels, it feels like they came up with an ending and then they just shoehorned it onto the episode. So it kind of lowers it slightly for me, but again, I still have a lot of fun with it. It just, it raises kind of weird questions for me. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Derek, what about you? Yeah, I dug it for what it was. It's kind of a slower paced episode. It's kind of has like a more of like a what's the word I'm looking for? Like kind of like a ultra Q feel to it with some of like a you know the mystery of what's going on within it until the monster stuff starts happening. But overall, okay. I kind of there that? is an ultra Q episode that I recently watched because I'm going through the set, and the whole episode is about this kid who's trying to do these certain things so his turtle will get giant and take him to, like, the kingdom of dragons. <laughs> That's the whole fucking episode. And it involves, like, robbers accidentally taking his turtle and him, like, chasing down the robbers and then, like, at one point getting the robbers, like, fucking AK-47. Like, it is just a weird episode. And now that you mentioned, like, Ultra Q, I'm kind of like... Yeah, I could see this kid dying by getting hit by a car and the monster he created uh, destroying cars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For sure. And, uh, yeah, I dig that about it. It's kind of like a, like we, me and Venom said, like a curse, like, ghost film mixed with, like, a kaiju film. 
in a way. And you know, I I, I see where Don's getting at. It, it, it's just hard to try to expand some of these storylines with like the amount of time that the show has for running runtime sometimes. And you know, with that said, I just shut my brain off to that mostly because. You know, the fight was pretty entertaining, especially with me doing it, like just having that that bird raped Ultraman. He literally did. <laughs> I saw like he ripped pulled his legs up and went right into his asshole with it. You know. But and then he bitch slapped him after. It was fucking awesome. <laughs> he fucked him up. <laughs> it was a great fight. I, I enjoyed this episode. I'm not sure where I would rank it yet because I gotta go through like the whole series still. But it's up there for me. Yeah, I really enjoyed the episode. I thought it was a lot of fun. I like that they did something different with it. At first, I was kind of like, while I was watching the uh, kaiju fight at the end, I was kind of like, what the hell is going on? Why is Ultraman, like, only, like, trying to shove it? Like, throw a fucking fist, man. What the hell? Um, And then they kind of pulled that, that M. Night Shyamalan plot twist on us. Which makes me go, oh, okay. Because I don't think the kaiju fight in this one is anything special until you go, ha ha, Ultraman got his ass beat. Then you're kind of like, okay, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's it's a weird episode, and it works. I really do enjoy it. I really do like it. I think there there's a lot to kind of dive into for this one. Um, and a lot of it kind of just doesn't come into fruition until you end up finishing the episode. And it made me kind of go, man, I feel like I should watch this again just because I may see the whole episode in a different light re-watching it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, uh, for the record, you rewatch and you go, okay, no, it's the exact same. I just know what's going on this time. But it doesn't <laughs> make it any deeper or better. Um, you get that with, get... like, yeah, you get that with like a lot of the cursed ghost films too. Like, you're like, does that, does that make sense to me? And you rewatch it. Okay, it's a little bit better now because I understand a little bit more. You know, so I get you there. <laughs> yeah. So, but it was a cool episode. I really, I really dug it. Um, it definitely stand out. Stands out as one of the more unique episodes for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, with that being said, I guess we're going to wrap it up here, guys. Um, so, we're going back to Godzilla next time. So, who knows what we're going to get uh, in there. Um, so, I guess we'll uh, go around and let everyone talk about their millions and millions of podcasts or uh, a typical Friday night for Venom. <laughs> go ahead, Venom. All right. On the latest episode of No More Room in Hell with uh, our friend Derek B., uh, we looked at a couple of outer space horror movies. We looked at 1981's Galaxy of Terror, a co-starring uh, Sid Haig, rest in peace, my friend. Um, and we also looked at 1997's Event Horizon. For the Burning Questions segment, we looked at our favorite and our listeners' favorite horror movie locales and read a few comments um, you know, from the Facebook group on that poll. And then on the sister podcast, to no more room in hell fresh cuts we just recorded our episode last night for the recently released um the hunt uh from universal pictures and mr jerry herring was actually able to join us for that one as well oh who else was on that show with us chair i forgot willis uh, willis willis yes that was the other one yes yes that was a nice uh because willis covered for me on it's not horror okay uh last week because uh, i was dealing with a case of food poisoning which made me miss a couple of podcast episodes, much to my chagrin, because I went years without ever missing an episode. And then over the last couple of months, I've already missed two. So, yeah, 2020 is definitely kicking Mr. Venom's ass. Anyway, um, and on the aforementioned, it's not horror, OK? As I mentioned, I was not on the last episode, but Willis uh, covered for me nicely. And they looked at the second movie in the Bronx Warriors trilogy. Uh, I forget the actual name. Escape of the from the Bronx. Movie. Thank you. Escape from the Bronx. There it is. Um, so, yeah, you can look for that commentary from It's Not Horror, OK? 
And then on In the Mic of Madness, uh, Rebecca Reinhart and myself are still in the middle of our Friday the 13th retrospective. We just recorded and released our latest episode on Jason Goes to Hell, the final Friday, which should have been Friday the 13th part nine. But of course, that is where Paramount walked away from the franchise and New Line Cinema took over. Uh, they bought the rights to Jason Voorhees, but not to the name Friday the 13th, which is why every Friday the 13th movie after part eight does not actually have Friday the 13th in the title, other than the remake, which was from Paramount. So that's a whole nother story. Uh, but look out for that one. On the next episode of In the Mic of Madness, of course, we'll be looking at Jason X with our friend Bill Casanelli from the Horror Mafia and the Slice and Dice Dreadcast. And um, multiple guest spots that I've done recently that I can't think of off the top of my head. So look out, look out for me. Flip, I mean, you can you can throw a dart at a dartboard filled with podcasts, and you're likely to hit one that I'm on. So enjoy. <laughs> 100% true. Uh, Don, what do you got for us? Uh, not much. Just a bunch of uh, guest spots. I've been doing a uh, series with NFW on uh, snake movies. We've uh, recorded Anaconda one and two, and I believe we're gonna. I think we're gonna pause the franchise, and the next one we're gonna do is. <laughs> but I, I don't know. If, I don't know if that's um, and I th that was the plans that they were talking about because uh, they wanted me on to talk about them. Yeah. Apparently, they got mixed up and thought that I was into all creatures that start with an S, so. <laughs> oh, that movie that is called S S S S S S S. Yes, I recall that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, yeah. Were, we we actually reviewed that on Theme Warriors about a year and a half ago. Interesting little movie, to say the Shrug, least. Shrugger Martin. Yes. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, the only other one that I've done is a uh, guest spot on uh, Two Drink Minimums. That uh, should be out soon. We looked at uh, Desperado. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah, you were also on last week's Fresh Cuts. Or was that last week or two weeks ago? Uh, that was last week because this week's we just recorded yesterday. I forgot. I've been quarantined for too long. <laughs> oh, no worries, brother. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Then the other um, podcast, as Venom just mentioned, is uh, no more. Is a uh, on the. April is on the March one called uh, Into the End of the Dark Crawlers episode. Yep. So. Good times. Yeah, just uh, doing a bunch of guest spots. So. Fair enough. All right, Derek. Well, uh, what am I going to say? It's been a blast to be back, guys. You, as you can tell, if you've been following me on social media, I've been in kind of a rut and uh yeah cinema attack will be back we had to push our shows back with everything that's going on so we because we're all busy because we're all still working for some weird reason in this hellhole situation that's going on but we'll be back in a few weeks with a trauma show and uh celluloid dissections will still be recording too we just set up a new date and uh we'll get that out for you guys soon with uh the crazies and uh let's sleep in corpses lie that should be out probably sometime not next week but maybe the week after depends on when we get around to editing it and also of course uh the next episode of no more room in hell which is my choice which should be coming out and we're recording the fifth is uh dead kids and next of kin two australian productions and uh yeah and then they're here we have to set up a date for our new episode because I know Lacey is busy with the Leprechaun franchise right now, so... Uh, That's no way to talk about Dan. Yeah, I, I love Dan. <laughs> At no least someone with. does. <laughs> <laughs> I have no problems with Dan. But, uh, I don't anyway, either, so, but I'm just cracking a joke. I know you are. <laughs> but anyways, it's good to be back. I need this guy. You guys had me cracking up because... You know, it just happens. You get in some of those moods sometimes. So, uh, thanks, guys. Underwater Kaiju is here to support your mental health. Hell yeah. We're a service Thanks. podcast. Wait, what? Service? <laughs> we're, 
we're a service podcast. Yeah. You know, so we help people deal. Yeah. We're an essential podcast. You oh, are, I like it. We don't get shut down. Um, uh, oh, wait. Before we go, I forgot to mention, too. I do have two guest spots coming up. One I'll keep secret, but uh, should be out tomorrow, I think. I actually uh, guest starred on uh, the next episode of the Club Dreadcast, where uh, looked at uh, the color out of space. So that should be out tomorrow, I think. Nice. And the other one, I'm keeping a secret till it drops. It was a fun time. I need to find someone else who thought that movie sucked so I can do a podcast with him and we can spend like an hour just talking shit about that movie. No one else thinks that. You're the only one. No, I know. A, it's a problem. There's a, there's a show out there. I think it was Horror Movie Talk. They crapped on it. Wow. Yeah. Did they write a whole fucking rant like I did. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, it, it's been a while. I think that was... I think that was was them i think that was the show because mm. i mean second quarantine i've actually gone through my shows like crazy so everything's just started bleeding together but <laughs> i think i remember i think it was them that they did a show and they crapped on it now nah, well fuck them all right so uh <laughs> as for kill the cast we just did um from Beyond and I See You from 2019, that is the I See You with Snapchat filter face Helen Hunt, not the other one. Um, uh, great episode. Uh, check out I See You. I highly fucking recommend it. I don't know what the next Kill the Cast episode is. Um, I don't know what the next Underwater Kaiju is. I don't know. Uh, I don't know anything because I plan everything uh, on a Monday, <laughs> I, record, I plan it on a Monday and we record it on a Sunday. Uh, that's how I do things. Uh, but um, as a lot of you know, I kind of took a uh, brief hiatus from recording so uh, to get some health stuff uh, situated. But now I am back again. I got medicine. Medicine's working. We're doing things now. As long as I don't die from the coronavirus because I'm a fucking diabetic, it'll be okay. But until I die. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing some podcasts, so, um, Kill the Cast will be coming up, Atomic Age Sauce Cast will come back, uh, we, uh, Venom, I'm going to hit you up tomorrow, we're going to start talking, uh, Cult Unknown again, uh, Ooh, yes. get back into that, because we need to, uh, I feel like I need a deep dive into something to, like, really, really fucking take up my time. Oh, yeah. Um, so... Uh, with with that, I guess that's it. Thank you for joining us on our visions from Monsterland. Uh, it's a blast as always. We will see you next time as we go back into the Toho world of Godzilla, and uh, I don't know, fucking don't don't fucking feed your guy Gauss. <laughs> yeah, don't feed your Gauss. Okay, let Gauss be natural vegetarians. Don't accidentally feed them your little brother. Now they're gonna. Now they got the taste for meat. They're killing everybody. Some kid got hit by a car on Route 87, and now that bird monster is destroying cars. And the gals are just showing up now to get the free fucking pickings because the bird monster don't eat that. That bird monster only eats synthetic vegetables made from fucking uh, the stalk of. Brussels sprouts. And he likes to rape Ultraman too. And it just and it just took me until right now to realize how fucking great we programmed this because we both dealt with bird monsters. Yes, we did. That that was even that was even a fucking by accident. I didn't didn't even realize that until he just said it right now. Mm, It's our bird episode. So welcome to uh the better way to spend an hour instead of watching birdcast from outer space. Yes, uh, this is now the Bird Watch. Uh, next week we will actually be covering be covering uh, what happens when you watch Bird Dimmick while on shrooms. Thank oh, you, no. everyone. Oh, we will I see you next that. time. Let's do it. <laughs> it finally makes sense. <laughs> it can't be worse. So fuck it, right? I know. All right, later, y'all. Later. Adios.
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.